Good morning. I'm Jane Chu, Chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, and the 191st meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now in session. So I want to welcome everybody here this morning, council members, uh, NEA staff, colleagues here in person, and everybody watching online at arts.gov. And so for the record, the council members who are present in person are arts researcher Bruce Carter from Miami Beach, Florida, violinist and music educator Aaron Dorkin from Ann Arbor, Michigan, music professor, arts administrator Emil Kong from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, arts administrator Maria Lopez de Leon from San Antonio, Texas, and producer, actor, writer Diane Rodriguez from Los Angeles, California. And the following council members are also joining us by phone. Museum director Olga Viso from Minneapolis, Minnesota, philanthropy professional Deepa Gupta from Chicago, Illinois, author and organic farmer Mas Masamoto from Delray, California, attorney, musician, and former member of Congress Paul Hodes from Concord, New Hampshire, visual artist Barbara Ernst Prey from Oyster Bay, New York, arts All patron have been trustee, muted. Charlotte Kessler from Columbus, Ohio, and we regret that council members Lee Greenwood, Maria Rosario Jackson, Rick Lowe, Ronnie Ramaswamy, and Tom Rothman are unable to join us this morning. But let's get back down to business. Uh, first, the minutes from our last meeting. May I have a motion to approve the minutes okay. of our March? Thank you. March council meeting. Is there a second? Yes. I'll say, um, all in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. So now we'll move to the council members' votes and their application and guidelines review. Uh, I'd like to invite Carol Walton, our Senior Advisor for Programs and Partnerships, Jillian Miller, a Director of Guidelines and Panel Operations, take us through the section of this meeting. Thank you, Jane. Good morning, Council Members. The tally of your votes will be announced at the end of today's session. This morning, you will be voting by ballot on 33 award recommendations, totaling more than $3 million in two funding areas leadership initiatives, and literature fellowships in translation. The funding recommendations are found in the corresponding sections of the council book. Your ballots should be on the table in front of you. Council members joining us by phone will please email their votes to Kim Jefferson. In order for your vote to be tallied, you must be present at the time of the motion, discussion, and vote. Council member affiliations have been recorded in the council book and on your ballots and you may update this information prior to the vote. Council members are recorded as not voting on applications with which they are affiliated. This list does become part of the agency's official record. <clears throat> After I summarize the two funding areas, you will have an opportunity to ask questions and or discuss the recommendations before voting by ballot. May I have a motion to consider the recommended grants and rejections under the leadership and fellowship tabs? Thank second. you, is there a second? Thank you. <clears throat> Now let me summarize the two funding areas, pause for questions and comments, and then ask you to mark your ballots. First, leadership initiatives support a wide variety of projects of national and field-wide significance. At this meeting, the council is requested to approve funding for nine projects, totaling more than $2.7 million. Support is requested for production of an online toolkit for job seekers and employers to help reduce barriers to careers in the arts for people with disabilities. Two, state arts education initiatives. The arts education partnership, sorry, two arts education initiatives, they are national initiatives, the arts education partnership and a statewide data infrastructure project for arts education. The Mayor's Institute on City Design, a program that assists mayors with urban design challenges. Performing Arts Discovery, which showcases American performing arts groups for international presenters. The Musical Theater Songwriting Challenge for high school students to expand the 2016 pilot program. And a National Services Initiative, with, which will support research, information, and professional development services for the NEA, state arts agencies, regional arts organizations, and in cooperation with the agency's state and regional arts education and folk arts programs. Are there any comments or questions from the council meeting? If not, please mark your ballots. 
Literature fellowships translation projects support translations of poetry, prose, and drama from other languages into English. This year, 22 grants totaling $300,000 are recommended. The proposed projects will support the translation of work from 15 languages and five continents. Are there any comments or questions about literature? If not, please mark your ballots. Finally, there is a list of 20% amendments in the awards update section, which will support pre-award amendments for each of the six NEA regional partnership agreements. I will now ask Jillian Miller, my colleague from Guidelines and Panel Operations, to summarize two sets of guidelines up for a vote at this meeting. Good morning. At this meeting, you're reviewing two sets of guidelines, both of which contain updates to existing categories. Your first set of guidelines is for research artworks. These are for grants for research projects on the value and impact of the arts. And there is one change to highlight for you. We've updated these guidelines to reflect the new five-year research agenda. Your second set of guidelines is for literature fellowships translation projects. These guidelines describe the agency's support for fellowships to publish translators, for projects to translate prose, poetry, or drama from other languages into English. And there are no changes to these guidelines. Are there any comments or questions about the guidelines? If not, may I have a motion to approve? A second? Thank you. In favor, please say aye. Any opposed? Any objections? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carol and Jillian. Uh, now I'd like to update you on a few agency highlights since our March Council meeting. So we'll begin with a budget update. Uh, in early May of this year, Congress approved the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2017, and that set the NEA's budget at $149.849 million. So this means that the NEA is fully funded for this current fiscal year, FY17, and we continue to make grant awards and honor all obligated grant funds that are made to date. On May 23rd, the Office of Management and Budget released the President's comprehensive budget, and the comprehensive budget expanded on the details of the earlier budget blueprint, which slated the NEA for elimination. And the President's fiscal 18 budget request for the NEA is set at $29 million for the purpose of closing the agency. Uh, you can find the full details on the NEA's fiscal 2018 budget on our website, and it's uh, arts.gov and it's under the open government section and as we've stated before uh, the budget request is a first step in a long budget process and we continue to accept grant applications for fiscal 2018 at our usual deadlines. Uh, in terms of travel I continue to travel to meet with par uh, grantees and uh, partners and arts leaders and our state and regional uh, partnerships. And I was in Alabama just a few weeks ago where I was able to congratulate organizations in person on their new NEA grants, which were announced earlier this month. I visited Montgomery, Birmingham, and Selma, where I was honored to be joined by Congresswoman Terry Sewell. Alabama has done a great job in honoring its traditions, and it's at the same time it's continuing to move forward all through the arts. So one great example was at the Sloss Furnaces National Historic Landmark in Birmingham. Uh, this is a historic site, and it was a former pig iron blast furnace, and it operated for nearly 90 years between 1882 and 1971. So today, Sloss Furnaces is a metalsmithing workshop, gallery, and event space with the use of these large 3,000-degree furnaces to create contemporary works of art. And the city of Birmingham just received an NEA Our Town grant to be able to create a plan for the construction of a new art and technology center at Sloss Furnaces. And that will develop skills and create jobs for the people of Birmingham. So you can see how this project is honoring local heritage, even as it has created new avenues for the future. We're also finalizing plans for upcoming trips to Mississippi in July and North Carolina later this summer. And by the end of August, I will have a visit all 50 states. 
So with every place I visit, I'm really struck by the vast and varied ways that the arts express themselves across the United States, because it, when it comes to the arts, there's something for everyone, and there are powerful, um, often transformational benefits for individuals and communities, all walks of life, all ages, uh, the communities large and small and mid-sized, urban, rural, neighborhood, tribal, because of the arts, and our state and regional partners and arts providers and NEA grantees and artists, they're so dedicated to connecting the arts to all. So we're very appreciative of everything people are doing. Over Memorial Day weekend, we kicked off our eighth summer of the Blue Star Museums program. Every summer, Blue Star Museums offers free admission to over 2,000 museums across the nation for active duty service members and their families. And last summer, more than 900,000 military members and their families participated in the program. It features museums of every size and subject. And the museums include art museums, science museums, children's museums, historical sites, and museums dedicated to all kinds of interesting subject matter. So there's truly something for everyone. And we're so appreciative uh, that so many museums are participating in this summer's program. It's a great experience for military families to be able to connect with our rich cultural heritage as well as with each other. And then on April 26, Samara Elan Huggins was crowned our 2017 Poetry Out Loud National Champion. Samara just graduated from Whitefield Academy in Mapleton, Georgia, and she plans to attend the Pratt Institute in New York this fall to study fashion design. Samara wowed the crowd with recitations of poems by Arthur Rimbaud and John Berryman and W.D. Earhart, and this is what earned her the top prize of $20,000. And for the second year in a row, we also offered another poetry category, Poetry Ourselves, which invited state champions to submit a poem they had written themselves. So state champions could submit their own creative written poem or a video of their own spoken poem. And both categories were judged by poet Naomi Shihab Nye, and the winners were announced at the national finals. So Theo Kai from the Hockaday School in Dallas, Texas, placed first in the written category for Poetry Ourselves. And Shelby Newland from Bloomington High School South in Indiana won top honors for the spoken category. And you can read and hear those 2017 Poetry Ourselves winners and also the runners-up on the Poetry Out Loud website. So between the finals and the semifinals, nearly 4,000 viewers tuned in to our live webcast of the event. And then on June 12th, we announced our 2018 class of NEA Jazz Masters. They are vocalist Diane Reeves, club owner, producer, and artistic programmer Todd Barkin. Todd's the recipient of the A.B. Spellman NEA Jazz Masters Fellowship for Jazz Advocacy. Uh, pianist, composer, and educator Joanne Brackeen, and guitarist, composer, and educator Pat Matheny. So our tribute concert for this year's class will take place on Monday, April 18th, 2018, at the Kennedy Center here in Washington, D.C., and we'll have information on how to obtain tickets for this free event early next year. And then the following week, we announced our 2017 National Heritage Fellows, Ella Jenkins, a children's folk singer and musician from Chicago, Illinois. Norik Astvatsatarov, a repousse metal and stone artist from Wapaton, North Dakota. Modesto Cepeda Brenes, a bamba and plena musician from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Dwight Lamb, Danish button accordion player and Missouri-style fiddler from Ottawa, Iowa. Cyril Pahinui a Hawaiian slack key guitarist and singer from Hawaii, Eva Ibarra, Kahunto accordionist from San Antonio, Texas, Thomas Maupin, an old-time buck dancer from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Anna Brown Ehlers, Chilcat Weaver from Juneau, Alaska, and Phil Wiggins, an acoustic blues harmonica player from Tacoma Park, Maryland. And the award ceremony for our new class of Heritage Fellows will be held on September 14th here in Washington, D.C., and the concert will take place the following day 
at the Lisner Auditorium at George Washington University. This is always a wonderful event, and I hope that you will be able to experience it either in person or through our webcast, and you'll be able to find that on arts.gov. So we're also thrilled that the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, which is happening right now here on the Mall, it's going to showcase a number of our Heritage Fellows. So this year's festival theme is Circus Arts, and 2015 National Heritage Fellow Dolly Jacobs, who is a circus aerialist, will be a featured performer. And there's a number of events at the festival featuring artists who have been named NEA National Heritage Fellows in previous years. There's Michael Dowsett, Cajun Fiddler from Louisiana, and Roy and PJ Hirabayashi from California, Taiko Japanese drummers, Juan Gutierrez from New York, who performs plena and bamba music, Mick Maloney from Pennsylvania, who plays Irish music on the tenor banjo, Billy McComiskey from Maryland, who performs on the Irish button accordion, Artemio Posadas from California, who specializes in son Huastecan music, Sheila K. Adams from North Carolina, a master storyteller and ballad singer from the Scotch, Irish, and English traditions. And then there's the Chuck Brown Band from Maryland. Chuck Brown pioneered the go-go music that fused together African chants and Latin rhythms. So please check out the Smithsonian Folklife Festival schedule and see when you can catch these performances. We're so proud of the National Heritage Fellows, our jazz masters, and they've continued to make their artistry available and with such excellence. So I also want to update you on the progress that we've made regarding the, expansions of, the expansion of our Creative Forces Initiative. So to set the context, you'll recall that Congress approved two back-to-back -back increases in the NEA budget both last year in fiscal 2016 and this year in fiscal 2017. And these increases are to expand our creative arts therapies programs for our military service members across the nation who are suffering from traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other psychological health conditions. So we built out a pilot plan to expand to a total of 12 locations across the nation. And we started Creative Arts Therapies programs in 2011 at two locations, National Intrepid Center of Excellence at Walter Reed in Bethesda and Fort Belvoir in Virginia. And then in October 2016, just this past year, we launched an initiative called Creative Forces to expand and reach service members and veterans across the nation. So we were able to add five new sites at that time. So we had a seven total locations. And then three months ago, in March of this year, we discussed the addition of four more clinical sites to the Creative Forces initiative. And that broke, brought our work to a total of 11 military installation uh, sites across the nation and their surrounding communities. And then now we're putting into place a pilot telehealth component to begin to reach those rural and those remote areas that we haven't been able to reach before. And that telehealth component is the 12th site in our pilot expansion. So the current telehealth site is testing ways to bring creative arts therapy to military patients in those remote and rural areas in Florida. And if the pilot shows promise, we're going to be able to look for ways to bring these services to other locations across the country so we can further expand the geographic reach of these programs and extend services to underserved areas of the nation. The piece that I really want to emphasize that makes the Creative Forces Initiative unique is that because of our national approach and the national perspective, and the National Endowment for the Arts really sits in this unique position that can make a difference in the system of support. So the initiative is not just that we're linking the arts to our service members and veterans. It's that the NEA comes with the 52 years of experience in being in local communities and having a national perspective at the same time. And that's our sweet spot. So I say when I travel often, that when you've seen one community, you've only seen one community. And we know how to coordinate the community provider, providers so that we can honor the different ways that each community and every state engages in the arts. And at the same time, we're able to connect the clinical piece across the nation so that our service members and veterans in need participate in medically supervised creative arts therapy and that they're also linked 
to the wonderful arts that's going on in their communities so they can be engaged in their communities. And these community arts providers are engaged with our service members. So it's a very successful network working system. And that's what makes the NEA Creative Forces Initiative so valuable. In terms of the community piece of the Creative Forces Initiative, so the community arts organizations that will complement our work at the clinical sites are in the communities where the clinical sites are located. And so these networks are being organized in close coordination with our state arts agency partners and other local artists and community arts organizations. We heard from a number of service members at Walter Reed and also Fort Belvoir that they were concerned they would not be able to continue receiving the benefits of arts therapy and arts engagement when they transitioned back home. So this piece of the Creative Forces program is designed to facilitate a patient's successful and healthy transition back into society, and it's critical for their personal well-being and the health and strength of their families. And so our local arts providers are perfectly positioned to effectively weave military families back into their communities. So to date, planning teams have now been established in nine of the Creative Forces locations. The 10th team, uh, which represents both Fort Belvoir and Walter Reed, uh, they sh that should be finalized in the coming weeks. And these teams have put together a process to launch the Creative Force programs in a way that connects the clinical and honors the actual way people engaged in the arts in their communities, wherever the clinic is located. Every team is starting out with a summit to bring together the various sectors and the players in the community for this program. And together, they'll create the framework for how local arts organizations will engage with our clinical, military, and veteran partners. And they'll be able to clarify the roles of the community providers and how they link to the military clinics. So this includes clinical therapists and visiting artists in healthcare settings and arts programs outside of the clinical settings. And there's also going to be an online toolkit and educational resources available. So a number of these summits are scheduled, and the first has just taken place in uh, the Hampton Roads region in Virginia to support the community surrounding the Joint Expeditionary Base. And then you can see on the screen where the other summits are taking place, Alaska, Texas, Washington State, Florida, North Carolina, Colorado, and California. And then we're still in the process of scheduling dates for summits in Kentucky and in the Washington, D.C. area. And then on top of putting uh, all of this together and the structures and the processes, we have also have some other continuous activities taking place. We had a clinical research working group meeting last week at the NICO at Walter Reed. There's a second research group meeting set for November at the Brain Science Institute at Johns Hopkins University. The Pentagon is currently exhibiting artwork from a number of Creative Forces patients. So you can see from all of from the moment we received our first budget increase in fiscal 2016, we hit the ground running in terms of following through with what we needed to do. So this concludes our agency updates. Any questions from the council? Now for the rest of the morning, uh, we're going to see four presenters that represent the various ways that the arts are connected to our everyday lives. And all four of these presenters have received uh, NEA grants for their organizations. So our first guest, Dr. Ann Basting. Dr. Basting is the founder and CEO of Time Slips Creative Storytelling. So it's based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Time Slips has been operating for nearly 20 years, and it engages older adults who have cognitive impairment, memory loss, by encouraging them to imagine stories and poems and other forms of creative expression. So this is about replacing that pressure to have to remember with the freedom to be able to imagine. And it's through the arts. And there have been such moments of relief and joy, not only for the patients, but also their caregivers. And in addition to her work at Time Slips, Dr. Basting is also a 2016 MacArthur Fellow. She's a professor of theater at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where she runs the Student Artist in Residence program, and she teaches arts and social entrepreneurship. So please welcome Dr. Basting.
Thank you so much. Um, in light of that presentation, I'm just really humbled and inspired and really grateful for the chance to share my work, um, a little bit of the, the arc of the 20 years of the work and the evolution of it, and also a little bit of the project that um, was my first NEA-funded project that we've done through time slips. Um, I will start here and ask ourselves, what have we wrought with the way that we anticipate and care for our aging populations? Um, we in this country have a fierce love of independence, the shadow side of which can be a stigma of dependency or disability, um, can be a fear of becoming, a really horrifying fear of becoming a burden. Um, and so we have created also, I think, and I, 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 uh, I say that I do this, have done this myself, we've started out by wanting to cure that or, or help that by creating programs and interventions targeted at specific groups. But when we target specific groups, are we actually re-isolating people? How can we envision the creation of programs that use the arts capacity for self-expression and community building at the same time? We know now through research that social isolation is the health risk equivalent of 15 cigarettes a day. And researchers have shown us now that that's worse than uh, inactivity, obesity, and even binge drinking as a health risk. So really targeting at the power of the arts to bring people into relationship and community building is, I think, heading us in the right direction toward easing that sense of social isolation. When elders try to stay home as long as possible, is that really the best thing? Do we have connective tools to bring people into relationship even as they want to stay in their own houses? Even when we have them in institutional or congregate, congregate care settings, people can be in what I call group solitary confinement. You can be in a room of people with no connection to each other whatsoever. So how can the arts be used in that way? That's really become the bulk of the work that I've done which is to bring meaningful engagement to late life by infusing creativity into the care relationship and into the systems themselves. Coming from a background as a theater ensemble theater maker, I tend to look at the care relationship as an ensemble practice. And also then moving outward, which I'll talk about in a little bit, even to the care systems and bringing them into relationship into ensemble practice. Why the arts? The arts Arts are a symbolic and emotional language with no right or wrong, right? So we enable, it enables us to join together to create meaning and beauty and purpose. And this image is from a, 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 an artistic house call where Sojourn Theater, when we collaborated on a project called the Islands of Milwaukee, and we went out to individual people's homes to create little pieces of artwork in collaboration with them. And we did this dance for the love of Jim in their garden in, that Jim had designed. Um, t through time slips, we try to offer inspiration for people who this field is actually starting to really take hold. It's really a pretty exciting time for this at this moment, but people need an ongoing source of inspiration for uh, keeping the work going, um, connecting with people doing this work around the country, and training and support for both that sense of the methodology around the creative engagement, but then also those tools for community building, which is something that the arts have been doing cultural community development for quite a while, but the healthcare sector hasn't necessarily seen itself as a community um, because of, uh, particularly in nursing care, which has been on the hospital model for entirely too long, where it's been imagined to be transitory, heading people back to their homes, but people are actually living in congregate care settings for up to 20 years. And how can we use that sense of community building to connect people to staff and family in those situations? So how do we do all of this? We're, we're based in Milwaukee, but where we do our innovation and our lab work, but we're actually also mainly online. This is just a, a, a image of our website. And we have four core elements to the work that we do. The first is improvisation, which is the core is yes and, accepting anything that is given to you in the given moment and adding positively to it, which makes you meet the person where they are in whatever condition they are in that moment. The second is what we call asking beautiful questions. And a beautiful question is one that opens up a shared path of inquiry. There's no right or wrong, but you form a relationship while you explore that question together. The third is proof of listening, 
um, what I see proof of listening is demonstrating to that person that they're being heard and that they feel that in the moment. They can feel it in your change of behavior, in the echoing that you're doing of their responses to you. And then finally, opening yourself to wonder, which just means we don't have all the answers and there are some things we just can't know. And particularly with dementia, does the person understand me? I don't know. You have to act as though you do and open your sense to the self of wonder that maybe in this moment we will connect. Um, the website for time slips features hundreds of prompts, which are um, hopefully in a couple of weeks expanding from the creative storytelling mode, which I'll share in just a second, to creative conversations, creative projects, and creative storytelling as well. Here's just a little sample of um, an image that we commonly, this is a popular image from one of my favorite stories. Whoop, I'll back up. So actually a, a, a little super teeny interactive component. I will just ask a beautiful question. What, what would you like to name this fellow in the story? Anybody, you can just pop out an answer. Anybody wants to do it. Anything you want to say will be part of the story. So just shout out a name, anybody. Butterfly, and what did you say? Fred, Fred. So we have Fred and Butterfly. And where do you want to say this takes place? In Milwaukee. Fred and the Fred Butterfly is in Milwaukee. So it gives you an idea of just giving the keys of creativity to someone, and then I'm simply echoing and building a story out of what, if, what you say. That is the, the tiniest example of the kind of improvisational work that we do. You can do it with gesture, you can do it with sound, you can do it with line and color, any, any component of the arts that the person has capacity for expression. Now I get to share with you a story told by this, about this image by people with dementia. It is 1917. This man is a French First World War veteran who was in the shot in the back. His name is Harry. He's 27. He has a dancing cane for doing the cha-cha. He has no family, but a lot of friends. He is outside in France. He's going to a local cafe for a glass of wine. He is focused on contemplating his life. There's a giant butterfly behind him. He loves it. He's not afraid. It signifies peace. He's hoping to meet someone new, a woman perhaps. When they meet, they'll talk about spring and new beginnings. He's trying to forget what he experienced in the war. After that, maybe he'll get laid. <laughs> She'll get married not to him, but to someone she already knew, who bakes good baguettes. These stories are incredible, and they capture the life experience. I include this one often to give people, people say, oh, this is just like doing this with children. And I say, if you actually take that approach, you're going to get a little shocked by the content sometimes, <laughs> because these are people with long lives of rich experience. Um, and also, I think the hopes, um, they're entertaining each other and you. There's generosity and humor. And, and there's sorrow, too, in a perspective, I think, that can be contained in something beautiful. Also, we ask the beautiful questions as an example here is, what is the most beautiful sound in the world? And the, the kind of collage poem that came out of that was running water, silence, music. Abba, <laughs> I love that. You've got to have noise, just everyday noises, nothing too loud, buses, cars, everything. Um, we, we have at the core of our work, um, f and this is from research and then also focus group meetings that we did, we tried to get down to what is the meaning of meaningfulness. When we say we're creating opportunities for meaningful expression and meaningful connection, what does that mean? And for us, it has four elements self-expression in any way possible, pleasure, which can be, I, I refer to it as, it can be smiling or laughter, but it can also be the furrowed brow of intellectual challenge, um, a connection to the larger world so that one feels that there is a purpose to what you're doing. It has some sense of weight to what you're doing. And that's also connected to the final piece, which is pride and quality. And that, to me, is also where the professional artist as collaborator comes in who can create, in very simple ways, a framing mechanism to make this very, uh, uh, to create beauty and meaning. 
This is um, actually what you see when you click on the prompts. And we also have a collaborate button, which can invite people to do this from far away. And we did that for family members who can be halfway across the country or in the same town, but not have a positive way to do something together. Um, you can actually create a story together in that way. Uh, you can publish or save for later. You can have help um, with directions or questions. Um, this is just an example of uh, 6,000 stories on the website from 5,000 logged in users um, from 42 states and 13 countries now. Online training, I tell you, it opens up horizons <laughs> and creates networks of people who are interested in doing the work and getting us toward what I call the tipping point where this kind of practice becomes standard practice in care. We've actually gone on from the individual training of just the storytelling method um, to what we call our creative community of care organizational approach, which starts that work toward getting care communities and health centers settings to look at themselves as part of their community. The work we were referring to, I think, this morning about linking um, those the clinical setting to the home settings and bringing people into relationship. Um, where you, you prov the success for me is if we provide an activity that is so engaging and interesting that the staff wants to do it with the residents and the family members and the volunteers who usually come in with a sense of, I'll go in and serve and, and I'll feel good about myself, they're actually being rewarded and engaged in a way that they're just interested in the activity and part of the meaning making process. So those four um, principles that are at the core of what we do actually are the same principles that, that go outward. And it's really kind of lovely where the inner part is engaging individuals one-on-one. -on -one. You can also do it in small groups. And it's the same principles when you engage an organization and invite people from different areas within that organization to collaborate on a project. One project I'll talk about, the Penelope Project, the, the staff had never collaborated on programming from independent living to nursing to assisted living and adult day. They're all separately budgeted and separately programmed, and never had they done one large community building project. And then you can also get to the level where you're bringing people into ensemble projects across systems and sectors. So an example of that is a project we did that invited a home care company in, in the same project to collaborate with Meals on Wheels and a volunteer program that did telephone reassurance calls to make sure people are alive and answering the phone every day, a well-being check. And we did the same beautiful questions that went out to all the different networks and then did a collaborative celebratory event for everyone to participate in. And this is just arcs out that model which begins with training, moves through the creative generation phase where we send out the beautiful questions. We refine it um, through the process of the art making and design process with professionals. And then we hold an event, which is to me where not only is it, do people get to invest pride in what they're doing and feel um, a change in their social capital and value, but also it moves toward dissolving that stigma that keeps us in that glass jar. Uh, an example of this is just a, a project we just finished, which was our first 50 nursing home training across the state of Wisconsin. We also collaborated with six museums across the state. Those are the red dots. The blue dots are the, the nursing homes. Um, out of, we created this uh, guide of um, cr prompts from six museums. And because we're in Wisconsin, of course, we had to do the National Historic Cheese Making Center. We had to do the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame and Museum. These are beloved, iconic uh, cultural institutions across our state. The Maritime Preservation Program through the Wisconsin Historical Society, which I call the Shipwreck Museum, but don't tell, well, now they'll hear it because I'm <laughs> alive. But um, it's really fascinating um, uh, imagery from the Great Lakes and the shipping industry and the history of that. The Museum of Wisconsin Art and the photorealism of painter David Lentz, who donated all of his images to us to use for this project. The World Circus Museum in Baraboo, you should all go if you haven't been. Um, and then the Madison Children's Museum, which brings in an intergenerational component as well. And again, it's a 70-page prompt guide for them to use with creative conversations, creative storytelling, and mini projects as well. And then through our Artworks project, we um, used the stories that came out of those 50 nursing homes. We built a collaborative team of artists 
who then took all those stories as inspiration and created this, it's a little hard to see the book, but it's about three feet high. There's screen prints um, with images inspired by the stories themselves that when you bend the book, the Im you can see the, the, the fish image would connect and the front page image here connects as well to create the book of connections. And the idea was that these images were inspired by the stories, but in turn, they can inspire more stories. And this can tour to those 50 nursing homes if they want to have a celebration themselves. We also worked with um, a dance class um, called Choreography in the Community at UWM to bring the stories to um, a, a nursing home in Milwaukee. Um, nearby the, the, the university, and they went through a process of inviting the elders to create original choreography, which then they adapted into a dance piece that we performed at the State Alzheimer's Conference. Um, and I will show you, we, we performed, we also invited the elders to read it. We had an animator create a layer of music, the elder reading the story, images from the story and the choreography into um, animations that became kind of a karaoke version, which I wish I had time that we could all do it in here because it's really, really fun, um, where an audience of 900 people actually participated in the dance making in an interactive way. We didn't know uh, in the moment if the audience of 900 people would help us choreograph uh, one of the stories by the elders. Um, but I tell you the great joy of seeing a room of 900 people doing original choreography and committing. You can see the commitment in their faces here. Um, the, it helped that the music in Wisconsin was also the beer barrel polka. Um, so uh, again, the joy is pretty palpable here in the audience as they were creating. I think one incredible thing to know is that these people are committed to care for families, for people in, their, people in the, in the um, health systems in which they work for. Um, it is hard, underfunded work that they do. They, they bring a passion to it, and we're trying to bring them tools that keeps their, their inspiration going to keep them doing this work and to keep them connecting in new ways with the people that they love and serve. Other just quick examples of projects that we've done in this way that build toward that community festival celebration model. This is just one quick image of a project called The Crossings, where we worked with older adults to um, empower them as pedestrians, to bring them back and to feel um, confident in crossing the street. And we had civic officials crossing in street performances with the elders themselves. This one was particularly powerful because this light was officially too short. There were five senior apartment buildings around this um, intersection and a grocery store that people were all taking vans to because they couldn't cross the street in time. And the mayor discovered that he and Nancy, the woman in the walker, could not cross the street in time. And the lights were lengthened by the next week. So it's a very effective uh, way to make uh, change in this way and to bring people back into confidence um, in crossing. We did a, a performance um, that uh, my university was staging Little Women, the musical. And I said, I would like to do a community-based project called Slightly Bigger Women. And so we did. <laughs> You know, you have to be careful what you say in meetings, because then you have to do it. Um, so we held intergenerational screening parties of the three versions of the film of Little Women. We did intergenerational letter exchanges, because they write a lot of letters in Little Women, about who they dreamed of becoming and who they still dream of becoming. And we set up pen pal relationships from an intro to women's studies class and the people who were living in the care communities in Milwaukee. Um, and then we staged a professionally a, a, a play it, on the season at UWM, but also staged it in the care homes as well. And this is just a scene, I love this photo because of the exuberance you can see um, uh, from a program that's now part of Time Slips called Stage Write, where they write original musicals with people with Alzheimer's and stage them in a three workshop series where they do brainstorming in the Time Slips model, um, they write original choreography, they create characters, they um, uh, write original musical. They have an accompanist who's writing it on the spot with them. And then they stage it in the third workshop for family and staff. And it is um, 
a raucous, joyful experience, which is not the usual words you associate with Alzheimer's. Um, the Student Artist in Residence program last year, this is our, we're entering our third year with students right now. Um, Ian McGibbon on the right here uh, lived at East Castle Place for a year um, in exchange for arts programming and really becoming part of the community. Uh, we had three students living in care homes and three other students who were receiving a stipend. Not everybody can open their valuable real estate to uh, having students live there, but some did a match stipend model. And it, it has changed the lives of the young people and the old people, older people alike. And then I want to just share quickly the last um, uh, image and then a video that follows it is of a project that really transformed my life. It was a three, two year effort to re-vision um, the Odyssey from the perspective of Penelope, the hero who never left home, um, at a, a long-term continuing care community um, with students from my class who we taught to facilitate creative workshops in the creative generation phase. The staff learned to do the creative generation phase. Sojourn Theater collaborated with us. We gathered all the input and created an original play, which we staged site specifically for an outside paying audience through the care community itself. Um, and here you see Lenny Cruz, who was our choreographer. Um, we were just incredibly lucky to have him with us. He was getting a PhD in urban education at the time, and he had danced with Pina Bausch. Um, he walked into the rehearsal room, and we almost fell over. <laughs> he introduced himself by through Hawaiian gestural language, which we since discovered has been an incredible way to reach people with Alzheimer's. Um, and they created a welcome dance, which you'll see in this final scene. Um, and I will play it for you. So the, the project itself, um, uh, you'll see this clip takes you from beginning to end of the project, from, the vi from us creating the elements and doing the creative workshops to the performance itself. So I'm gonna, is it okay if I push you over there? I'll, I'll get up and, and turn you around. Because, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> is it, it's a lock on? Oh, there we go. Arnie, you didn't, you didn't tell me your lock was on. We were, <laughs> we were gonna go for a roller coaster ride otherwise. You know, the story is all about Penelope. We're looking for Penelope. We go through all through the building to find her. And when we finally find her at the end, there's not one Penelope, there's a hundred. So that's what we find on the other end, that actually we've been looking for Penelope, but there's a Penelope story in everyone. That everyone is weighted, everyone has love, everyone has a story of, of being a hero in your own life. My eyes, they sparkle like stars. Stars. I'm calling you. I'm calling, calling you. I am seeing you. Your eyes, my beloved, sparkle like the stars. You are the ones that make this place home. You are the ones that make this place home. If the gods will grant us a happier old age, a happier old age, we'll be free from our trials at last. We'll be free from our trials at last. If the gods will grant us a happier old age, we'll be free from our trials. So can you create something so interesting and meaningful that the family wants to come and participate, that the students' lives are transformed, and that they actually consider going into work this work as a career, that the, that the stigmatized health center becomes a cultural center and a resource for its larger community. Those are the questions that are really fueling our work. Um, and of course, I, I won't go into this whole thing, but we're really blessed to have meaningful research wrapped around it so that we can keep moving it. When you're working at that juncture in healthcare, and really in any sector, 
that data and that research means everything to make the argument, to spread it and, and implement it across the board. Some of the feedback, I'll just, we did a book about the Penelope Project because it was such a powerful experience for us. And the book is actually an edited um, uh, essays from all around the spectrum of people who were involved. And these were just some of the feedback that we've gotten. Um, I feel so relaxed and calm when we're storytelling. This is the last important thing I will do in my life. <sighs> that one gets me. <laughs> um, I used to be afraid of old people with dementia. Now I realize they're just human beings who want to be loved and feel a part of their world just like anyone else. Time slips gave me extra tools to really reach my clients. It's the most creative technique I've ever used. And it's like I didn't lose my dad when I would sit in on his storytelling. She was proud to see her story featured with a local storytelling group. She got a great response and felt like a star. Um, some of the innovations we're now peeling off from this. As you can imagine, once you get the fever of innovation in this sector, you just keep going, is um, time slips by phone, offering connections to people who are isolated. Aging is really going to become a rural issue. A huge demographic shift is taking place where the younger people are coming into cities. And, um, and there's a, people are out there isolated. And that, that sense of social isolation is going to be a real public health. It is already, and it's going to increase. So we, we're hoping that that can actually connect people to meaningful projects. This is a shot of teen facilitators who are um, taught the method and paid to go out to um, aging, age, aging folks in their own communities. And that's underway right now. Um, we have uh, in the works three creative festivals in Kentucky. And this time, rather than the Odyssey, we're looking at taking apart the myth of Peter Pan and looking at the meaning and value of childhood at any age. And I'm particularly looking forward to the flying part of that one. <laughs> and then we're building a new web platform to get all these innovations out um, as well. So again, I am just really humbled and grateful to have the opportunity to share the work and um, looking forward to the future and what it holds um, because I, we all need to get this work so it's all in place, both for our parents now and the elders that we have who are our friends and neighbors now, but also for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the council for Dr. Basting? Anna, it's so powerful. The work is so powerful and it's so emotional. Uh, I, I, you, there were so many interesting things that you were uh, talking about, but one of the things that I was particularly interested in was this notion that current health care and the memory care facilities are transitory. Uh, and that, that really what the work that you're doing is adding to it, creating a living space. And you mentioned a tipping point. I mean, certainly in your state, uh, the work seems to be flourishing. How close do you think you are to a tipping point? <gasps> I have to turn there. I turned that on. Um, it's a great question. Uh, it's in, in some ways, I um, I think there's really incredible work. There's Arts for the Aging here in DC. There's there's pockets of it happening around the country. Um, I think that. Um, sometimes I can feel like we're closer to a tipping point because I, 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 I collaborate and learn from people in that space doing that work. But I think in general, we're kind of far away from it, especially I think right now we're, we're in a place where the, the funding for these, this long-term care is, is in jeopardy. And how, what is that going to mean? You know, the, the whole sector might crack open. Um, and I think in general, the, I'm excited by the, the cross-sector work that I've seen really growing with the arts and that it's becoming both, both as an academic and an educator. I'm, I'm starting to offer programs and I'm seeing programs where the field, the, the jobs might not exist yet, but we're teaching the students to actually make their work in this field. So it's happening simultaneously from the, the care communities opening themselves to these ideas because the research is helping to prove that it's effective and also um, economically viable for people because it helps keep staff engaged in the work and reduces turnover. Um, but also from the, the, the artist and arts training side where there's an energy um, around meaningful work and engaged work for arts practice. So we're heading there. We still have a little ways to go. 
Thank you again for that. That was really powerful. Uh, so I have a father who is in one of these facilities and has Parkinson's related dementia. And um, he was a physician for 40 years. But um, of course, Korean was his native language. And uh, slowly as Parkinson's has really gotten worse and dementia set on, on has begun, his, his, he's lost all of his English and really gone back to his native language in Korean. And one of the issues that we have with him in his facility regarding isolation is the, his, uh, his inability to communicate, not even when he could, because with Parkinson's now he can't, but that he does think and communicate in Korean now. So I'm wondering if in this program, have you thought about non-English uh, non speakers and what the role that the program you're doing, if, what kind of an adaptation it needs, if anything, to those who, for English, is not a first language? It's a great question, and I think that the, the beauty of sort of creating that magic circle where people can experiment with communication is essentially what we're doing. You know, in the, I have this, you know, I have a PhD in theater, so you have to excuse my metaphor, but in medieval theater, <laughs> you would take a broom and sweep a circle to denote the performance space, and I feel like we, we use that broom to create sort of this magic circle where people can experiment with any kind of self-expression that they have, it, it's about the question coming in, being open and clear enough that people can feel comfortable experimenting with a response. And particularly, this is a pretty common thing that people retreat to their original languages. And um, you know, I talked with one place in San Francisco where they said, we have 17 languages uh, being spoken here and we, we have to have this flexibility. And in some ways the arts are the perfect thing to use in that situation because they can cross culture and language, particularly movement um, and also visual art. Um, the, the word, the language based can, can hit snags, but I've also done creative um, storytelling sessions where I, I don't know what I'm echoing. It's clearly a lang sometimes it's not any language um, because of aphasia issues and sometimes it's a it's a foreign language that the person is testing me and it's a little bit dirty <laughs> doesn't bother me because I don't know what it means but um, but and they laugh because they're they're able to exercise power in a moment where they have no power at all so that to me is the real creative force of those sessions is when people are practicing with with movement or language and and being echoed in a very powerful way. So it's drawing out the expression and encouraging people to continue doing it because that is what draws people out of isolation. Uh, a follow-up question. So if uh, another community who is um, uh, very excited by the work that you're doing wants to start to test pilot some of these ideas, how would that, how would that, how would that happen? The, the best way right is just to come to the website and, and send us an email and we'll figure out what's going to work best for that community. We're, we're real, we're, to me, the most exciting thing is, is um, working in systems because that's how you'll get to the tipping point. Um, we, we're, we're just in conversations with a, a group that has 66 memory cafes for people who are living with memory loss at home but trying to use these cafes as resources and support sources and training people who are facilitating those in these methods and then setting up partnerships with cultural institutions as well. So it, it can go to community-based living folks or people in congregate settings. And ideally in my fantasy world, those things that, that the arts and the meaning making is the soft tissue that connects people across transition. Um, like we were talking about with the creative forces, that that, that culture-making catches you and supports you as you move from one living condition to the other. Because in aging, it's always a crisis that is compelling the move. And if you have that sense, I'm still going to have a meaningful existence where, wherever I'm moving next, is is really crucial. And, and do, so I'm sorry. And do the... <laughs> uh, all of the, the differing levels of healthcare providers, um, they all have roles in this this work that you're doing as well? Yeah, we're, we're working on that on creating um, what we're calling creative councils in, in the various organizations so that people, the, the beauty of this kind of work also in ensemble work is that it's an equalizer, it's a democratic process. Everybody, because there's no right or wrong, you can kind of reorient the hierarchies and definitely in the health settings, the clinical, the higher, the closer you get to the MD, the, the higher the power structure. Um, and so we use it to unite um, the direct care, often called a CNA or um, certified nursing assistant, or the person who's the closest to the to the body work, um, 
then the activity workers and the clinicians, the social workers, the, the nursing and the administrators can all buy into this, do a sample session, realize what's happening in those magic circles, use it for team building themselves, but then also for community building with their, re their residents and um, the families and um, outside community members. And thank you for the wonderful work that you do. I, I, uh, I too ha had a mom who had Alzheimer's and I lost her almost a year ago, but I remember uh, she re didn't remember other things, but she re would remember songs and poems that she would recite, you know, when she was a young girl. Uh, and I, I know how important that is, you know, to, to so many uh, people with dementia. Uh, but I just want to congratulate you for uh, weaving this network uh, of, of changing uh, the way that we take care of, of our elders and for uh, really beginning to change policy. And I just wonder if how much do perhaps uh, an occupational therapist or that field, you know, interact with, with the work that you do? I keep forgetting I have to turn that on. Um, we have, uh, I think one of the, the programs for me at the juncture of being an artist and an educator and a scholar is a service learning program that we do, that we offer the online training to classes of students who can then go out and practice it in their community. And that also is a huge help. It's like we're training a volunteer corps, but then also developing a workforce because this is often the, the the first positive experience people have with aging and, and disability so that they actually consider going into the field. And we do have several occupational um, therapy classrooms across the country that we're, we've been working with because um, it's so clearly right in their wheelhouse of, of a benefit of an approach to what they do. Um, also social work classes, nursing classes, um, everything from theology classes because this work tends to be it, it, it has a very spiritual frame to it, recognizing and honoring and inviting the person um, out. Um, English classes, because it's a storytelling and narrative component, we really have this interest across service learning for all different areas. And I think occupational therapy is, has been a big proponent of that. Thank you so much, Dr. Basting. Our next guest is Dr. Kenneth Roby from Matheny Medical and Education Center in New Jersey. I had the pleasure of visiting Matheny with Congressman Leonard Lance last July, and I was so impressed with their work. Matheny serves children and adults with complex developmental disabilities, and many of them are quadriplegic, nonverbal. But Matheny has this arts access program where patients can express themselves through painting and poetry and writing scripts for plays and choreographing dance. So professional artists will come in and they will guide the patients through the process of creating step by step and move by move, whatever the patients want to create so they can express themselves. And so Dr. Roby is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. He was the founding president of the Alliance for Disability in Healthcare Education. And Dr. Roby, we're eager to learn about Matheny's Arts Access Program, the benefits to the patients, as well as the artists who work with the patients. So please welcome Dr. Kenneth Roby. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Chu. Uh, short people and podiums don't mix particularly well, so uh, if you can't see me behind this thing, let me know, and I'll be glad to describe myself to you. Uh, now, I am not directly associated with the arts program that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, rather, I am a research psychologist at Matheny who had opportunity through an NEA grant to study that program. Uh, but the arts access program's wonderful director, Eileen Murray, is here, and uh, if I fumble any of your questions about the program, she'll jump in and correct me. Uh, in recent years, programs that enable people with disabilities to participate in the fine arts have been established around objectives of self-expression, uh, social integration, perhaps vocation. And in some of these programs, the participants are artists with the most complex disabilities, people who may have very little 
uh, if any use of their limbs. They may, in addition to that, be nonverbal. Uh, they may have some combination of both physical and intellectual disabilities. And in these programs, the artist's work may be accomplished through the use of facilitators who basically act as the arms and legs of the artist. And uh, the Arts Access Program at Thene is one of those programs. It's a 24-year-old program that facilitates opportunities for people with disabilities to participate in the fine arts. And, uh, and that would be performing arts, literary arts, and visual arts. And it provides them with exhibition and performance venues, publishing and sales opportunities, and other means of earning uh, income and recognition for their work. The, the uh, facilitators are professional working artists who serve as impartial uh, physical connections between the artist and their medium. And uh, I, I want to underscore that word impartial. Uh, they are extensively, extensively trained to abstain from any influence on the creative process. Uh, the facilitator follows the artist's instructions faithfully and executes those instructions faithfully uh, to apply paint to canvas on behalf of the artist, to apply pixel to screen, to apply knife to sculpture medium, to apply a movement to a choreographed dance. And it's done through a system of very complex uh, menuing systems and a lot of yes-no questioning. Uh, again, I'm not directly affiliated with the program, so I think the Arts Access staff would be far better to explain the principles of the program to you. So I do have a film clip here. Arts Access is a uh, fine art program for the clientele of Mathena. The categories or the disciplines that we offer are, we have uh, traditional painting, we have uh, digital sculpture, we have uh, writing, we have drama, we have choreography, and we have uh, creative movement. The four principles of Arts Access are uh, freedom of choice, um, neutrality, artists assisting artists, and no preconceptions. Freedom of choice, that means that any choice or decision that can go in and affect the outcome of that canvas, uh, no matter how small the decision is, it is the clients to make. The clients are here to make all of the creative choices for a dance, for a painting, for a play. Uh, they are free to be who they are when they're here. Um, their personalities, they're not inhibited in any way. We always begin with the choice of, uh, do you want to work today? Um, you know, that's their first choice. And everything even if it doesn't necessarily affect the outcome. If they're mixing two colors and they want them to be a solid color at the end, uh, we will ask them, which way do you want me to stir the bowl? Am I going this way or this way? And again, the color's gonna come out the same no matter what way I turn that spoon. However, it's a decision to be made, so it's theirs to make it. Because um, if I don't ask them that, if I'm going, they may get the inspiration, stop! You know, if you have multiple colors, it will affect how they've laid out into the bowl. Uh, so, even, you know, the simple little things, it's, it's their decision. So that's the freedom of the choice. If it's, there's a choice to be made, it's theirs to make it. Uh, neutrality. Um, this one is the one I probably preach the most to the facilitators coming in and in training. There's subtle things you can do that can lead a client to a specific conclusion. Which you just don't want to do. It's just it's cheating the process without you consciously knowing you're cheating. Because if you nod a little or while you're making a suggestion, you know, even if you're doing it idly, the person in the chair that you're working with is very observant and will see that, even if it's subconsciously and not not know it right away. Stop shaking your head. <laughs> um, no preconceptions. Uh, it's more of like a general guideline for everybody is that you don't judge people based on their abilities or their disabilities. You also don't judge the art that they're creating on any outside schools of thought. It's whatever they want it to be. It's however they want to create. We don't look on it. You know, a lot of the paintings are, you know, abstract expressionism. 
but without that knowledge, they don't set out to create it. It just is. Uh, who cares if it's ballet, you know, it's going into abstract modern dance. Who knows what people are going to be coming up with in drama and, and writing, you know. I don't care if it's a perfectly structured sentence because who am I to tell someone who has never spoken a word in their life that the words they want to lay out are not meaningful or important. Uh, so that's no preconceptions. And, and last and certainly not least, are, we're artist assisting artists. Now what that means as facilitators, we have to treat all of our clients with the same respect that we would our peers. Um, we, all, we know if someone's coming just because it's fun to be here. And we know when someone's coming in here that is a very serious artist, but we treat them both with equal respect. And that even if this person's just coming here for fun to throw some pain around or um, doodle for the day just because he wants to hang out, I don't care, he's an artist when, when he's in this square. Um, also, we keep, you know, when we're artists and artists, that keeps the facilitator and the client on equal footing. And again, when we're in this square, the client is the driving force of the work. We're just technical ability, we're, we're hands and feet and know-how. Uh, so we, we're really the unimportant factor. Uh, to give you a little sense of the volume of the program's products, 577 individuals currently participate in arts access programming either at Matheny's facilities or in other outreach facilities that have adopted the arts access philosophy and strategies. Since its inception in 1993, the program's participants have produced 1,623 paintings in acrylic, 137 dramatic scripts, 1,814 physical paint, or excuse me, digital paintings, 70 3D digital sculptures, 57 physical sculptures, uh, 57 choreographed dance pieces, and 1,020 short stories, poems, novels, and essays. And these works have been viewed in about 140 public events or shows, impacting roughly 927,000 individuals. Uh, now, as a psychologist, what interests me most about arts access is the opportunity for choice and how that relates to one's sense of self-determination. Those of us who don't have these complex disabilities re really don't realize how many thousands of opportunities we have each day to make simple choices. The choice to pick up this remote and put it back down. The choice to clean my house, which I typically don't do, but I have that choice. Uh, and as, sense, as such, we have this sense that we have the ability to manipulate our environments. We have some degree of a sense of self-determination. Uh, now, the people that uh, you, you've seen here in this film who have complex disabilities typically have very, very few of these opportunities on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So what does it mean to their sense of self-determination when they find themselves in a context where they can make choices and create and dictate and influence the things around them? Uh, I and some colleagues at Matheny and at a facility in Ohio called Hattie Larlam, which a number of years back adopted some of our arts access uh, strategies, had the good fortune to be awarded a grant under NEA's Research Art Works program to look at that relationship between participation in the arts and self sense of self-determination. Uh, the research team gathered both quantitative and qualitative data. And uh, we, we gathered it from both participants in the arts and others who are at those facilities and have similar disabilities but do not participate in the arts. And what we found in those data was, uh, I think, quite interesting. And I want to share with you some of the qualitative results of that study. Wanting to understand the degree to which arts participants and non-participants feel that they have some control over their own lives, we asked them to talk about things that happened to them due to luck. And uh, what we found was that the people who do not participate in the arts generally talked about lucky outcomes. Uh, I survived a car crash, or I had an opportunity to go to a Yankees game. These are things that uh, they really had very little input into, things that basically just happened to them. Uh, but in contrast, when we talked to the arts participants, they talked about lucky opportunities, things that uh, they then actively pursued, or things that they made some contribution towards. Uh, I had the opportunity to show my art at a gallery. That was lucky. 
Uh, so they talked about things that might be a lucky, lucky circumstance as they related to some accomplishments. So that difference between the two groups, I think, was rather striking. Here's a quote from one of the arts participants. When I finish a poem or a piece of art, it's work and luck together. It's luck that I got the opportunity. And uh, participants in the study were also asked to talk about something that they had actively made happen. The non-arts -art, participants generally talked about things that they had accomplished in terms of self-care, uh, which is a big thing for, for these folks. One patient said, I followed the nurse's directions and my wounds healed. And I, I don't want to minimize that in any way. It is a, a huge thing for these folks to contribute to their own self-care. But when we talked about arts participants, they didn't talk about self-care. They talked about things that they had accomplished in occupational areas or, or artistic areas. They talked about the number of paintings that they had produced or the fact that they had done a poem that uh, was appearing in a book. Uh, now, they didn't always necessarily talk about art. Uh, one person said, I was able to contribute to the accessibility plan for the new Yankee Stadium. Uh, but they were always things that were outside of themselves and even outside of the walls of our facility, uh, as opposed to the more self-care oriented things. Now, uh, another interesting thing that we found that might tell us a little more about the nature of the relationship between participation in the arts and sense of self-determination is that while a few of the individuals expressed that they did feel like they had been changed through participation in the arts, most of them did not. They, they didn't represent it that way. They expressed that rather than feeling changed, they felt life options had been opened up for them, that uh, they now had greater opportunities to express themselves. One participant who felt this opening of life options said, I love the fact that I get to be whatever I want, an artist, a writer. It gives me more options to be who I am. Being an artist makes me want more to do the best I can. Now, I, I do want to emphasize that in, in these findings that I'm sharing with you, uh, unfortunately, we can't really talk about causality. Uh, unfortunately, the study, because of certain limitations in how we could design the study, uh, was not one that could tell us that participation in the arts causes more of a sense of self-determination. In fact, it may be kind of the flip side. It may be that a strong sense of self-determination guided people toward participation in the arts. And people who didn't have that sense of self-determination may have steered away from the arts. And my sense is that it, it's probably a little, little bit of both. It may be that they had a sense of self-determination that did prompt them to look for opportunities like the arts. But then once in the program, participation in the arts probably fed back to reinforce that sense of self-determination. And I have a, a beautiful story about this young man that I unfortunately don't have enough time to read to you. But for, suffice it to say that through exploring an area of the arts with which he was unfamiliar, he's typically uh, a painter, but uh, he w did become involved in drama and writing, uh, he had kind of a very powerful recognition that he had an opportunity to share his life story through writing. Now that is something that I think any of us would think is kind of obvious. We can all take a pen and a piece of paper and start writing about our own life stories, but perhaps in part through lack of options being presented throughout his lifetime, it never really occurred to him that that was an option. And it really was an extremely uh, powerful revelation to him that he now could do that. And I think that's kind of emblematic of the nature of this arts program. Uh, I think we would all agree that there's a lot about one's sense of self-determination that boils down to economic productivity. Uh, can you imagine having limited or no use of your arms and legs, uh, but then finding that you can create art that ends up on ties and ties and scarves, on coffee mugs, uh, you're writing poems that may appear in books that are sold and read, uh, and then getting paid licensing fees for it. And I, I think nothing quite speaks to self-determination than merch fees. Right? Uh, or how about the sense of self-determination and impact on an environment uh, when you have 
again, no use of your arms or legs, but a sculpture that you designed is fabricated into a, I don't know if it's 10, 12 feet tall, fiberglass permanent installation on a beautiful hilltop. Uh, and this really is kind of the centerpiece of our facilities campus. Uh, so in closing, on behalf of Eileen and her staff at the Arts Access Program, uh, I just want to acknowledge the Arts Access, uh, or, excuse me, the National Endowment for the Arts support for the Arts Access Program uh, in 2013, 2015, and again in 2017, mainly in support of the uh, Arts Access Program's signature event, which is called Full Circle. And as I said before, uh, I want to acknowledge the uh, Research Artworks grant that allowed the research that uh, I spoke about today. Thank you very much for the opportunity to tell you about this. Thank you. And uh, questions for Dr. Roby and also Eileen, would you come join us? Eileen is the director of the Arts Access Program. We may have questions for both of you. The young man that you uh, spoke about just uh, at the end of your presentation, I was curious if um, his disability was was uh, caused by, I mean, was he born this way or was... was uh, yeah, that young man had uh, mm -hmm. cerebral palsy, fully nonverbal, uh, very limited use of his arms and legs. Uh, he has at times used a power wheelchair that he operates with head-mounted switches. Uh, extremely bright young man. Um, he, uh, through his paintings, uh, he, he was the young man with the head-mounted uh, paintbrush, uh, and with some assistance from his father, started a greeting card company featuring his, his paintings, uh, sells them online and at conventions. Very bright young man. Uh, uh, but you know, as, as I indicated, there are certain things that due to a lack of exposure to ability to make choices, he just hadn't really realized were open to him. Uh, can we just touch back on this, the causality issue? I know you mentioned that the study wasn't designed to actually um, look at that. Uh, and you and analyzed it as maybe being a bit of both. But is causality an important question to answer in this work? And if it is, how might you go about doing that? That's, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I would say that uh, causality is important in order to demonstrate efficacy of the program to funders. Uh, funders may not approach the arts uh, along the lines of that question that you posed. To them, it may not be an issue of, is it important? The issue may be, are we having a therapeutic benefit of individuals? And if you can't demonstrate that this program is having a therapeutic benefit on individuals, then it may not be funded. So in that respect, just if nothing other than pure pragmatics, uh, I think it is an, an important uh, question to, to answer. Now, with regard to how to do that, uh, we were operating under the constraints of having uh, just two facilities that we were able to work with. And uh, it was a situation where these, uh, at these two facilities, there's relatively little flow into and out of the program. Uh, those at the facilities who are appropriate for the program and want to be in the program are in the program. So it's not a situation where we could take a pool of people who are not exposed to the arts and randomly assign them to, you're going to participate and you're not. Uh, so that, that's one of the biggest problems with, with determining causation. Also, we had a relatively small sample size. And when you're talking about quantitative data using psychological scales and the like, uh, that N, the number of individuals, really has to be up to a certain point. We, we weren't quite able to reach that. I hope that work is done. Uh, it likely will not be done by our facility. Uh, research has kind of moved out of our organization's mission. But uh, I certainly hope and would love to support anyone who does pursue that. And two-part question. Tell us how you came to the Arts Access Program. You're the director. Uh, and then the second part is, what gives you energy? What gives you the most, uh, what are you inspired by, by this program? 
to call you Anne. I'm sorry, it's Eileen. Oh, that's fine. Um, so funny, the second part of your question, um, I was thinking, what gives you energy, Jane? <laughs> you seem <laughs> nonstop, which so appreciative of everything you do. Um, I came to the program, I really think it was um, serendipity, uh, you know, right place at the right time, and I didn't even know that that's where I was supposed to be. And my background is in um, graphic design. Uh, I went to school for advertising design, and I had worked in that field for a number of years and really felt that, wow, it, I wanted to be doing something that was part of a greater whole, and I didn't know what that was, so it was kind of at a career crossroads. And a friend of mine just said, at the time, people found jobs in the paper. She said, check the paper every Sunday. And I found an ad for a program, sort of a unique program. Um, I don't even remember what it said. I don't even know if it said anything about people with disabilities. But it, it caught my eye. And from the moment I walked in there and met some of the artists, before I was even hired, I was thinking, yeah, I'm going to come back whether they hire me or not. So I hope that's OK with them. Um, and I, I really did. I, I, I fell in love with, with the program and in meeting the artists. And the first thing I saw was the artwork. And as you've seen and can see, it is astounding. Um, and when you walk into the gallery at, uh, at the Art Center, the work, um, it, it speaks off the walls. It, it really does. Each piece is such a personal expression from that individual. And I think the second part of the question is that's where I get the, the energy, is, is the artist. Um, as an artist myself, I see them coming down to the art center, um, you know, in order to accommodate everyone, we schedule in half hour blocks, which is not a lot of time for any artist to create. So, you know, we're open in the evenings for people to come down for more sessions. And during that half hour block, as Ken was saying, it's not, um, it's not me putting paintbrush to, to canvas. It would be me as a facilitator asking those very deliberate questions and waiting for absolute answers. So a lot may not happen in that time, but what happens in that time is priceless. And I see these guys coming down in the evenings. They take advantage of every moment they can. And I get my energy from this person is that devoted to their heart, their art, and how much more difficult it is for them to practice their art, I, I better get on it. Just from a personal side and from a professional side, these individuals deserve every single opportunity that every artist has. And um, I feel it's my responsibility and my honor to do that. Other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next guest is Jennifer Cole. She's the executive director of the Metro Nashville Arts Commission in Nashville, Tennessee. And when I visited Nashville last August, I had an opportunity to see how the Metro Nashville Arts Commission was connecting the arts throughout Nashville in ways that encouraged creativity for artists and linked the arts with other aspects of our everyday life. So Jen Cole also serves as a board member for Americans for the Arts. She's the chair of the United States Urban Arts Federation. She's a member of the Policy Link cohort on arts and culture equity. And so Jen, uh, we're looking forward to uh, your descriptions of the way Metro Nashville Arts Commission has integrated the arts with our everyday lives. And please welcome Jen. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Um, so uh, I've been asked to talk to you today a little bit about what a local arts agency is and what it's becoming in our communities. So raise your hands out there. How many of you know what a local arts agency is? Oh, good. Class A. Um, 
so ah local arts agencies, there are about four thousand five hundred of them around the country from all volunteer um run organizations to organizations like mine to the city the the new york city office of cultural affairs, which has more than a hundred staff people um thanks to the and endowment sort of in a long history of investing in those institutions, they are often cultural anchors in a community that connect various systems and sectors of artists and cultural organizations, residents together um, in a particular arts ecosystem. We know through the local arts agency census that um, in 2015, local arts agencies contributed $274 million of um, revenue into arts ecologies around the country, making them collectively one of the largest investors in the arts um, in the United States. Um, I happen to work in a really amazing city. Um, uh, my office is part of the city government. Um, I report up to the mayor and to a board of commissioners. Um, and so I work at this phenomenal intersection and nexus between all the kind of crazy systems um, in, a, in a community from housing to transportation to education um, to the arts ecology itself with individual artists and cultural organizations and co-ops. And today I want to tell you a little bit of our story and the story of um, what a lo local arts agency was maybe in 1978 when we were founded and what um, we are becoming through our improvisation practice, <laughs> um, as some others have talked about, and kind of how we are responding to our community um, around relevancy um, and excellence. And so uh, I think it's fairly common that many ar um, local arts agencies were founded really on this sort of core model, with the idea being that there are resources in a community, they could be from a government like ours are at Metro Arts, um, through collective um, workplace giving campaigns or others, but really to drive resources through public art or through grants to cultural agencies often um, which net a transactional impact, meaning that sort of our meaning is derived from uh, a conduit for dollars. When I first came to Metro Arts uh, about seven and a half years ago, the very first question I asked my staff was, what is it that we do? And I got a variety of answers like, we give grants and we put it, we install sculptures. And I said, no, 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 what is it that we do? And, and why is it that we do that work? And I got a variety of head scratching. And so we began a journey to reimagine um, our work as more than an ATM uh, for cultural arts um, and more about what we now um, sort of talk about and what my friend Roberto Rodoya uh, refers to as um, creating belonging. So what would happen if rather than seeing ourselves as a sort of, again, giant ATM machine for the arts, we really imagine that arts are an anchor to a variety of other community-based systems. Um, systems of social equity and inclusion, systems of health that we've talked about a lot this morning, housing and creative space, environment and land use and wages. What would, what would happen if we began to see and begin to ask questions about not what are we funding, but who, is, who belongs because of our work? How is it that we facilitate belonging with artists through their wages, their wage growth, their access to career paths? How is it that artists belong in our community? How is it that cultural organizations belong? How are they creating belonging for others in our community? Do all the residents of our community see their stories in the cultural products that are happening in this community? How is it that we become a conduit not for money, but for belonging? And so when you start to ask these very nebulous, hard, and, and sometimes uncomfortable questions, um, you began to think about and reimagine your work in completely different ways. Um, and one of the stories I want to tell you today through a series of examples is how the endowment's particular opportunities and investment in us and in our larger ecosystem in Nashville have helped us begin to make a pivot and a transition away from seeing ourselves as a bank to a group of investment capital for change and belonging. So for the last five years, my agency has operated on a theory of change with creative belonging at the center, that every single resident in Nashville, all 280, or not 200, 680,000, um, with uh, 100 moving each week um, to our growing metropolis, uh, we're expected to be a million plus community in the next 15 years. Uh, how is it that every single one of those people has access to creative belonging? And we process this through a series of work and focus around this, this fantastic three-legged stool that if we really invest in creative workers and if we really think about the both and of are there more of them and is the quality of their life in our city, in our community, wonderful. Do they have access to wage growth? Are they treated fairly? 
Do they have access to health? Um, do, they ha do they have access to housing? Core conditions that artists must have to live in, just like the rest of us, before they can create. We can't ask someone to create if they're challenged by their lowest Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so how is it that we look at those things? Because we can't just sort of give people grants to create if they don't have a house or a studio space, or they can't get, um, with because of transportation, access to where they need to go. So how is it that we really invest in the belonging of artists in our community by getting to their core needs? The second is um, creative neighborhoods. Um, so first we focus on people, then we focus on place. So there are, and we'll talk about this, in our community, most of our formal cultural infrastructure is concentrated in one square mile of our downtown core. But I refuse to believe, and neither does my staff, that that's actually the culture the only culture that exists in our community. So the question becomes, how is it we as a local arts agency unleash the power of culture that's already in neighborhoods, living with individuals, within people, within faith-based communities, and sort of how can we reimagine what cultural and creative communities look like for belonging? And then last is participation. And I apologize about my slides. When they translated to this, they, they were all actually justified earlier. But it's, it's creative. You get it. I'm. I'm I'm an artist of words, not of slides. So, uh, and the last is really participation, sort of who participates, who gets to participate, whose narratives are told in our community that create and facilitate agency and belonging. And so the reality is not just one-time transactional participation. I want you to renew your subscription to the symphony, to the opera, to the ballet, but how can we move from that one time to that ongoing sense of daily creative participation so that it cuts across culture, across ability, across age, and that you feel like you belong and can participate in a creative life um, where you are. We do this through a variety of things, through financial investments, through training, through practices and policies. And one of the things I'm so happy about and so proud to share with you today is that the endowment has, and the endowment's work over the last three to five years in our agency has really um, served as risk capital for us to test some of these new ideas um, with some really powerful results. And I want to share a couple of those with you today. Um, so through an Our Town grant in 2015, we really were able to poke at this question of creative workers. Nashville is um, often at the top of lists of you know, most vibrant creative places. And often one of the reasons we're there is because of the sheer number of creative workers we have relative to our overall population. Um, so we're known for our songwriters and our musical talent, but we also have a significant number of artists of all genres. But one of the things that we really want to look at is how do those people continue to arc in their careers? Are they always kind of at an entry level in their careers? Do they have opportunities to grow? Um, and particularly when we looked at our public art program, we found ourselves always importing artists from New York and Seattle and LA and we thought that that was wrong like what what would it take for us to grow the talent in this community so that those artists were growing within their own career arcs but that they were also connecting vibrantly to community institutions that they wanted to work with so we initiated a program called the learning lab um, we work with Michael Rode and Rebecca Martinez of the Center for, Perform for Performance and Civic Practice we selected 25 local artists of all different disciplines from sound design to theater to magic to writing to um, visual artists and sculptors and brought them through this series of workshops where with CPCP we really explored their practices as artists. Where did they want to go? And we really settled on this nexus of civic practice. How could artists compel their careers, grow their wages, make themselves more marketable, but simultaneously be in service to, to the community and to community partners? We brought together a network of community partners from Catholic charities to organizations with adults with intellectual disabilities to our public hospital um, to our transit alliance and started asking the question what happens when these artists work with these social institutions public and private and began to ask how is their artwork in service to to a social need and how is the social need in service to that artwork and how can we explore those opportunities. Um, we then, all 25 artists were given the opportunity to apply for funding, some of which did not have to be outcome based. The idea of giving an artist a funding that could just be about a process and not a product, whoo, revolutionary. Um, and so uh, we, those projects are all in the process of finishing right now, but we have everything from a local ceramicist who has um, created a, a, a complete studio with working with adults with intellectual disabilities who are actually scaling and creating pottery work for her husband's farm um, and restaurant. Um, incredible sort of soup to nuts social social venture sort of project um, we have artists working with our with our um, hospital on sort of patient outcomes and care but perhaps the most 
incredible example to me is the example of Courtney Adair Johnson. Courtney is a, a trash artist. She takes things that people throw away and makes them beautiful and, and reimagines them. She happens to live in the lowest census tract neighborhood in Nashville. And um, as, go, while going through the lab, she began to ask this question about, you know, her, her practice had really been about trash and sort of making things beautiful. And she started thinking about the, the, the people communities tend to throw away and the experiences people tend to throw away and how could she reimagine those as treasure. So she walked one day into what we call a family resource center. It's um, an old school building. It's run by Catholic Charities. And it is a place where residents in North Nashville can go for SNAP benefits, emergency food boxes. But generally, it is a crisis Band-Aid. <laughs> it is an old, it is two folks sitting in an old school who wait for crisis to walk through the door. And Courtney walked in and said, I live here. And I believe that the residents in this community want and need something different. And what would happen if we turn this idea of crisis into opportunity? What would happen if I kind of just lived here with you for a little while and we reimagined it? That started last April. Um, this is a, an initiating project. That the, the center is named after Curly Magruder, who was a civil rights leader, but the neighbors didn't really know that. Courtney initiated a residency program and for six weeks really engaged residents of all ages um, of ages in this discussion. And what has transformed in the year and a half since that moment is truly incredible. There are now six artists in residence, <laughs> um, five of whom are African-American men who grew up in that neighborhood and who um, have now used the residency program to turn what had been a uh, street art side hustle into full-time residential artist opportunity and wage, wage steadiness. Um, she has initiated partnerships with both Fisk University and Tennessee State University, the HBCUs, her, who are each within half a mile walking distance. There are now neighborhood curators um, who come from the neighborhood and curate art installations and work. There is weekly art classes taught by local, um, local artists. Um, and we are now in a discussion with the, the city um, about the permanent ownership of this facility being an art um, and employment training center for the entire neighborhood. Right now, today, there are 10 kids <laughs> um, through a paid summer residency internship program. The mayor has initiated a, a summer employment program for 14 to 16 year olds who are often under or non-employed. Um, and there are 10 kids right now, today, um, at Magruder, um, exploring um, graphic design, and street art as viable employment um, opportunities within the neighborhood. Um, and they have just redesigned the logo for, logo for Magruder Family Resource Center. And Courtney and Marlos, her, her partner, and the five other artists that are there are permanently in residence. So in, in a span of 12 months, we, with working with artists and working in all the intersecting systems in um, that neighborhood, we have transformed something from a crisis moment to a huge opportunity that is seen as, as Anne had pointed out earlier, a cultural center for this neighborhood that doesn't have that. Um, and so, and that's the opportunity. And in that, what I'm proud about is that the artists have, have great, um, increased their wages. Um, they're leading to viable opportunities for them as individuals and their sense of belonging and the sense of neighborhood belonging to this place has fundamentally transformed. And this is happening over and over and over again in the lab program. We'll be doing a second phase of the lab this fall with neighborhood-based artist teams um, who will sort of come in and be working within multiple um, institutions and systems within a neighborhood. So this is an act of current. We, we were lucky enough to get a Creativity Connects grant, and this is a this is another example of how we are poking at these systems. It would be really easy for us as a local arts agency to give a grant for a, a dance or a theater or a, a new symphony orchestra and walk away. But the reality is neighborhoods and systems all around our community are in dire need of this sense of belonging. And so um, it makes sense for us to insert ourselves into places that we're often not invited, like transportation conversations or affordable housing conversations. <laughs> um, this is Madison, Tennessee. Um, the city and the county merged in 1960. And when the city and the county merged, all these little tiny rural um, villages were absorbed into the larger county. Um, Madison, Tennessee is about eight miles outside of the downtown core. 
um, and has for many, many, many years been kind of a rural um, enclave within the larger set of Davidson and Nashville and Davidson County. It's a place um, that's been a hotbed for songwriters. Johnny Cash once had a home here. Um, lots of songwriters and hee-haw talent um, once lived there because it has big lots and backyard studios. But our city is changing really rapidly. Um, in 15 years, we'll be a majority minority community. Um, this, this community has a huge number of seniors, but it also has a, one of the largest spikes we have in our Latinx immigrant population. Um, and so the dynamics of this community and its demographics are changing rapidly. Um, and it is like this, many strip mall after strip mall after strip mall, some of which are vacant property. So we don't have a cute little downtown core <laughs> to reimagine. How does, how does a mid-sized community like ours help artists anchor and reimagine really important things as these sort of neighborhoods are in transition? But not only that, how are artists working with all the other existing systems within that neighborhood? So our grant actually is in process right now, works with the Barnes Affordable Housing Trust Fund, um, a nonprofit housing developer, Altogether Madison, which is an, a, an association of neighborhood associations, the Chamber of Commerce, our planning department, our library department. And we're basically, through a multi-pronged approach, inserting artists in the equitable development process of this neighborhood. So right now we have a residency program um, that's in an old park community center with an with a, um, artist who's sort of exploring where are the cultural centers of this neighborhood? What does happen? What gets people excited? Um, in the next year, um, we will be working um, on uh, housing policy. The mayor just announced $25 million bond issue, $25 million bond issue that we'll put in where the city will begin building affordable and mixed use housing. And we will be able to study the role of artists in housing-based policy, particularly in this neighborhood, um, as well as in corridor redevelopment. So I am at more affordable housing conversations sometimes than I am at cultural conversations because we want artists to be able to stay in this neighborhood. We want artists to be able to grow in this neighborhood. And we want them to be able to, to sort of imagine their retail presence in this neighborhood. The other key component of this is the transit. So this is a major arterial transit corridor. We've also just um, initiated a major light rail effort where this will be the terminus of a light rail hub. The city, it's a southern city, we don't do transit, um, <laughs> not well. And so having neighbors and artists reimagine not just what the arterial access is with transit, but what it looks like and how it helps their lives culturally is going to be critically important to this corridor. So um, over the next six months, we'll unveil a series of temporary art installations, residency programs, um, all kind of really poking at the systems question and how artists are vital to the systems. The last thing I want to talk about is actually not a grant that we received, but where we were part of a collective impact model um, with our public school system. So it gets to this whole idea of cultural partic creative participation. So for years, um, I think most music school, music and pro school programs do strings, orchestra, and band, um, maybe chorus if you're lucky. Um, we're Music City USA, and about five years ago, uh, we decided that we needed to really focus on the change in demography of our public school system and how we can make music more relevant by increasing participation. Like most school systems, we saw a precipitous drop off for African American and Latinx students um, in by the time we got to middle school. And we started asking, well, why? Why aren't people participating? What could we do that is different? So we created a collective impact model called Music Makes Us that combines the power of the music business that is very strong in our community with our work with individual artists and cultural organizations and completely reshaped how music is taught in the public school system and what music is taught. Uh, we now offer, um, at every elementary school there's music, um, middle school to high school we have over 12 electives including bluegrass, songwriting, hip hop, rock and roll, um, world percussion, and we have the largest, fastest growing mariachi program in the country. Uh, <laughs> um, offering curricular content that actually appeals to the kids who speak 100 different languages in our public school system. Um, and it has exploded. We've seen increased um, participation rates um, in every one of our demographic groups. And along that um, research, um, pointing to um, the, the more students stay in music programs, um, their academic and their social benefits go up as well. But the most important thing that this has done for us is actually help transform from our end as a local arts agency how artists and cultural organizations engage with the public school system. So um, this has really remapped how artists um, perform as teaching artists, the relevancy that they bring to the classroom, 
as well as our cultural organization. So instead of bringing the musical petting zoo, which is sort of typical for um, orchestras, et cetera, is helping them to remap the talent of the musicians that they have in their cultural organizations to the actual needs of the student. We've created an online hub where teachers can actually locate teaching artists and cultural organizations who can bring targeted programs that meet their pedagogical outcomes um, into the classroom. Um, our new administrator of schools has just quadrupled the um, uh, the uh, the staffing allocation for music and arts in the public school system and launched a new STEAM effort in the public school system because of the success and the rigor of this collective impact model for music. Um, I would also probably be a bad person if I didn't mention that we have the only high school recording label um, in the world <laughs> at one of our local high schools um, set up by Warner Music and um, where students can literally from soup to nuts from ninth to twelfth grade um, explore A&R, design, marketing, and production. Um, the music and sound engineers program has built a world-class production studio and they're cutting and releasing albums all the time. Um, and it is because though the industry couldn't do it alone, individual nonprofit artists couldn't do it alone, the school system couldn't do it alone. It is the collective idea that participation in the arts has to appeal to everybody and everyone needs to see their narrative in that or they will drop off. And so it's really been about the rigor of the diversity of whose story gets told and who gets to participate in that. Um, the other thing that for us it has done uh, from the, uh, the Arts Commission side is really increase the role of wages for workers um, and, and, and freelance economy. So it goes back to this belonging. In every one of these instances, in the Learning Lab, um, in Music Makes Us, um, in our Madison project, it is all about how we as an arts agency do more than the transactional, but do the transformational through relationship building and connectedness to systems that at the end of the day affect artists. Artists live in an arts ecology, but they also live in all of these other ecologies that we as local arts agencies must educate ourselves about and must become experts at so that artists can live, work, and facilitate belonging wherever they, they are. We've learned many things, um, and it's a daily thing, a, a daily exercise for us. Um, but I think the most palpable for us are to work across these systems, um, within the arts ecosystem and beyond, to really get up every day and think our work is about art and belonging, um, and to really focus also not just on the end product, but on the social and financial capital it takes artists and cultural ex cultural organizations to be excellent at their craft, um, and to constantly reimagine that we're not serving cultural institutions, we're serving residents who live in our city. Um, and that, that matters, and that matters a lot to the narrative that we tell. Um, we can talk more about this, but I, I would say that the National Endowment's investment in these very strategic things has helped us reimagine who we are and the local arts agency we're constantly becoming. Um, I want to sort of thank you for these intersectional and cross-sector opportunities because they are how local arts agencies work. I work in service to a mayor who gets up every day and thinks, how do I make the lives of residents better? And I can't just do that if I tell her that my job is to make pottery classes available. I have to translate how pottery classes availability gets to the life outcomes of human beings um, and how that translates to making a city a better and thriving metropolis. And so the kind of work that you have continued to do cross-sectorally has really helped us do our work better, and I want to thank you for that. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, questions for Jan. Um, I need to visit Nashville. <laughs> I've never been. <laughs> so I need to go. Please. <laughs> um, I love what you're doing, and I love this uh, intersection of, of uh, community and artists and yep. serving each other. It's it's yep. just such a great and 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 uh, worthy concept. You know, I was curious uh, about the notion of gentrification. Yep. Uh, we have an issue in Los Angeles, where I'm from, of a community just over the river on the east side, who uh, who have rejected the notion of having artists move into their communities because they believe that the next step is then, of course, real estate goes up. What, how, what have you done to address this? Yeah, that's this is huge in our community as well. So one of the things we're, we're doing a multi-pronged approach. One is to make sure that developers have primary relationships with artists. And so sort of so that artists are, um, 
artists are often by developers used as the bridge to make something sexy. So we have to sort of unpack that a little bit and help articulate that artists also need affordable and workforce housing. So the way we've approached this with our mayor's office is to sort of tell them, we don't want you to advertise that you need artist housing <laughs> or artist spaces. We, we need you to say that artists are just like plumbers and teachers and other workers. They need affordability and we need mixed communities um, of all different kinds of backgrounds and occupations. Um, but pro part of it is also making sure artists are educating developers so that they're not used as bait um, in these sorts of conversations. Um, and the, and the, we found by putting artists in design teams with developers, nonprofit and for profit, that that really makes a difference um, because they can advocate and say, no, no, I don't want to be used as a foil for that. <laughs> um, the reality is in cities that are growing quickly, gentrification will happen. It is a market force. I think the most powerful thing we can do is also to to support artists um, as, as citizens and residents so that they can also stand up for their own agency in community and change design decisions. I often will say that sometimes my life is like an episode of Parks and Recreation, but um, you can learn a lot from that because neighborhood meetings are really important. And if artists don't show up, if artists aren't part of the narrative of the discussion of the changingness of their community, then they can't take hold. Um, the Magruder example is a really good one. That neighborhood is changing very fast. Um, and those artists have actually formed a coalition and show up in every neighborhood decision making process. And one of the things that's happening is a real estate transfer between African American families who've owned um, what has been undeveloped real estate for a long time um, into selling that and sort of redevelopment. And they're very much a part of that. How do we help African American property owners create wealth for themselves by finally selling property that's now worth something? But how can we also keep the distinctness of this neighborhood, which birthed Jimi Hendrix and a variety of other things, um, as we sort of do that. So part of it is also facilitating their agency in those conversations, which they're often left out of. Most artists don't pay attention to like neighborhood meeting um, time. So so part of it's just also being there and, and listening, um, and doing a lot of listening. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, go ahead, Marie say thank you for this work i think it's amazing you know and i, I want to hear i want to learn more afterwards about the work you're doing with policy link yep. uh but creating that that uh cultural equity mm -hmm. uh because uh, my organization is also a partner in that and yep. i think that maybe we could <laughs> exchange ideas uh but i just like this comprehensive approach that you've taken and uh i how do you work with uh advocacy you know with for artists because there is a movement right now i mean there's a lot of arts advocacy work that is happening, but there's also this idea to create a cohort uh, nationally of artists uh, who want to run for office and to train them uh, to do that work. How big a role does uh, that kind of advocacy uh, around for artists play in the process that you do? I keep forgetting that's not on. Um, it hasn't been because I work for the city. It hasn't been a direct space where we're sort of, you know, recruiting and training people to run for office. But I believe that this is the first step in that. So part of part of what we're trying to do is help unpack how art intersects with all these other systems, with healthcare, with transit, with housing, with affordability. And once people, artists, cultural organizations, etc., understand how they are intertwined with those systems, they're then able to make those choices. I want to advocate for this, or I want to support a candidate who does, and sort of they feel informed by those issues. I'll give you an example that's not artist related. I sat our large cultural institutions down and, and just started asking them how much money on, off their bottom line was going to transit cost increased parking cost, valet, because we don't have a very good or robust transit system. And all of a sudden, these cultural organizations who had not seen themselves as sort of valuable in the citywide transit discussion, all of a sudden realized how much money they were losing because our transit system wasn't good, and all of a sudden have bandied together to really be a force for why we need this, why we need to invest it. And those cultural organizations bring the power of their boards, the power of their audiences to bear on that discussion. And at the end of the day, you know, paying over, you know, hand over nose for something because the system is broken is something they can find agency in. So we haven't sort of directly moved people into office, but um, we definitely sort of, are, I think, are creating openings for that discussion. I will say that our local arts coalition, um, which is a group of nonprofits and artists, very successfully lobbied d during the last mayoral term 
um, and actually put together a policy platform um, that they asked all the mayor candidates to commit to. Um, the candidate that won, my boss, uh, it um, has fulfilled all of those promises, including putting a creative economy person in her staff. And so I think that they can be very well organized into policy platforms that um, that do serve the larger community good, not just the arts community good. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're, you're incredibly articulate, and Thank I you. really appreciate that. Um, how do you uh, balance the need to nurture agency in, in individual artists versus in organizations, small or large? Um, that's a great question. We, we, we balance that equally. So my team is split um, in organizational and leadership development and artist and leadership development. So my staff are split amongst those two. I think that they're both critically important. Um, in an arts ecology, if you have only strong cultural organizations but weak artists, and the or the vice versa, it's not. So we really spend time working as as much um, as with cultural organizations as we do with individual artists. Um, I think for our particular community, as Dr. Chu said earlier, all communities are different. Um, we have not very many small organizations. And so we're actually really in the space right now trying to cultivate those neighborhood and culturally specific based organizations um, um, in a healthy way, not in an unhealthy way, so that they um, are more part of the larger dialogue and conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our final guests join us from Young Playwrights Theater right here in Washington, D.C. Young Playwrights Theater teaches students the art of playwriting, and through this process, students recognize that their stories are worth telling, and so they find empowerment through this process. It builds confidence, self-discipline, and it promotes the type of critical thinking that allows students to succeed wherever they go, and they can apply to whatever they do. And so here to tell us more about Young Playwrights Theater and demonstrate its impact, it's uh, Deputy Director Frank Serverich, Program Manager Jared Schamberger, and Nakia Green, who's a recent graduate of Columbia Heights Educational Campus here in Washington, D.C. I'll turn it over to you all. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Chu, council members, and other distinguished members of the audience, hello. It's very good to see you all today. And uh, we're in such excellent company this morning. Um, my name is Frank Severich, and I'm the deputy director of Young Playwrights Theater, or YPT. And I am delighted to have the opportunity to speak with you about our organization today. This is my first time using one of these clickers. I'm really excited about it. YPT inspires young people to realize the power of their own voices. YPT is the only professional theater in Washington, D.C. that is dedicated entirely to arts education. Our program model brings us into local classrooms to teach students how to write plays, and then we bring in professional actors to bring their stories to life. We take student work from the classroom and produce it on stages across the city. We seek to create social justice, to close the academic achievement gap, and to create equitable access to arts education for all students. YPT was founded in 1995 by professional playwright Karen Zacharias, and we reach thousands of students across Greater Washington every year, and thousands more members of the community through our productions of student-written plays. Over the past 20 years, YPT has engaged over 15,000 students in our artistic process and reached over 85,000 audience members with free professional productions of work by young artists. We work in all eight wards of Washington, D.C., as well as Northern Virginia and Maryland. For many of our students, YPT is the first chance that they have ever been given to express themselves creatively. School data from D.C. public schools shows that the neighborhoods that are home to the lowest performing schools are also home to the highest proportion of schools with no arts programming. As I'm sure most of you already know, opportunities for arts programming as part of the school day are vanishing as underperforming schools struggle to meet testing benchmarks with limited resources. DCPS does not consider the arts as a core subject, and DC is only one of six states that does not have an arts education instructional requirement at any grade level. YPT helps to bridge this gap by integrating innovative arts programming directly into underserved communities at no cost to students. We meet our students where they are through a range of programs and production opportunities. Our in-school playwriting program is our flagship program. We work in classrooms from elementary all the way up through high school. 
Through a 12-week interactive process, we, inter we introduce students to playwriting and theater arts, giving them the tools, support, and confidence that they need to write and share their own dramatic work. Every student writes, their, uh, writes a play and every, get, every student gets the opportunity to see their words come to life with professional actors coming to visit them in the classroom. The after school playwriting program has seen dramatic growth over the past year as we seek to create wraparound programming for our students, creating opportunities to work with students outside of the classroom environment. Our award winning, award winning Young Playwrights Workshop is based in our studio just up the metro from here in Columbia Heights. Students in the workshop work collaboratively on a play over the course of the year, and at the end of the year, they perform it in the annual Source Festival. They are the only student group to perform in this regional festival of new work, and we're extremely proud of them. Our summer programming has begun as of this week, and this year we are thrilled to be working with DC Public Schools to bring teaching artists to eight summer enrichment sites across the city, working with over 200 third to fifth grade students to write and stage original plays over the course of four weeks. The new play festival is the tentpole production of our season. We produce 15 exemplary student plays from the classroom on professional stages across the city, employing professional actors, directors, stage managers, sound designers, and technicians to bring the visions of our, st our, of our students to life. Silence is Violence was created in 2015 under direction from our creative programs man manager, Farrah Lawal Harris, and in response to our students' need for a platform and a safe space to speak about the Black Lives Matter movement. Since 2015, we've expanded the lens of Silence is Violence to include immigrant stories, and next year we look forward to hosting two Silence is Violence events, one centered on LGBTQIA issues, and one on environmental injustice and food deserts. And that is just a snapshot of the work that we do. By reaching out to students through targeted in-school, after-school, and summer programs at neighborhood schools and community centers, YPT provides students of diverse backgrounds with a supportive environment where they can exchange ideas and express themselves freely. Our work, as I'm sure you can imagine, is highly personal and is driven by a commitment to telling our students stories. Our students are at the center of everything that we do. We believe the stories that our students have to tell are valuable and provide communities with a powerful perspective about the youth experience. We believe that theater and the art of playwriting are essential tools in, develop, in developing creativity and self-expression and in fostering learning across disciplines. Today, YPT alumni are graduating from college and joining the workforce, many of them here in our region. Former students have completed bachelor's degrees, re received hundreds of thousands of dollars in scholarship money, and are employed across the nation and around the corner. Kenry, a YPT alumnus who graduated in 2015 with a degree in neuroscience, is now teaching biology at Bell Multicultural High School at the Columbia Heights Educational Campus. A former participant in our in-school playwriting program and Young Playwrights Workshop, Kenry credits YPT with helping him achieve his goals, saying that, quote, YPT provides a space for you to be as creative as possible. It really helped me create something that I can call my own. Our, assess our assessments consistently demonstrate improvement in students' literacy and engagement in their learning after completing YPT's program. YPT has worked with a professional outside evalu evaluator, Dr. Barry Oreck, to develop our assessments. Recently, Dr. Oreck engaged in a study to measure the long-term impact of YPT's programs on students. He conducted interviews with students and alumni whose involvement with YPT varied from one-time participation in the in-school program to longer-term engagement through in-school and after-school programming and having their work publicly produced. The most striking findings from Dr. Oreck's report included, quote, by far the most common and dominant response from both cohorts across many of the questions concerned personal expression. It was the, quote, I am somebody or, quote, I can be heard category. Students seemed fed by the, the invitations to create something individual and personally meaningful and by the opportunity to see one's words come to life theatrically. The 11 long-term students interviewed all noted that they received a kind of acknowledgement for their accomplishments that they saw that they say have had a lasting impact on their identity and their confidence. Oh no. Yay. Developed as a part of our 2013 strategic planning process, our Dream Impact Map articulates deliberate multi-year expansion of YPT's arts education programming in low-income neighborhoods and communities of color where students have less access to arts education. As we pursue our Dream Impact expansion, we seek to be flexible and responsive to the needs of students. 
finding ways to deepen our impact on students and their communities and provide them with new platforms to contribute to local and national conversations. Our Dream Impact Map lays out a strategic approach to achieve long-term outcomes for student populations in specific neighborhoods of Washington, D.C. Each year, we seek to expand our school partnerships in these wards as capacity and resources allow, while strengthening our existing partnerships and innovating new ways to deepen our impact in these communities. As we look ahead as an organization, we are encouraged by the growth we have seen since we began our work on the Dream Impact Map. Pictured here is Dominique, our first young artist fellow, who worked one-on-one -on -one over the course of a year to develop a play about police brutality after a friend of his was killed in the district by police officers. When he spoke to the sold-out crowd at the night of his performance, he told them, quote, my advice to other young people is to tell your story and don't be surprised if people listen. At YPT, we will always listen to and be led by our students. And in that spirit, you've probably now heard enough of me talking. And it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage our program manager, Jared Schamberger. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, everyone. Um, I will not be long. Um, because I have the distinct privilege of introducing one of our amazing students, Nakia Green. Nakia is one of our bright and promising playwrights. She was first introduced to YPT four years ago when she was a 10th grader. Since then, Nakia has been a member of YPT's Young Playwrights Workshop and our Student Advisory Council. She's represented the organization at several events, including this year's Giving Voice Awards Gala. Nakia's play Despair was a finalist in our new play festival and had a staged reading in 2015. Most recently, Nakia wrote and performed in the Young Playwrights Workshop show, Then and Now, which focused on the incredible journey from childhood to adulthood. Today, Nakia will be performing uh, an original poem, and you're in for a treat. We're going to have a reading of a play that she wrote last year called The Hardest Stuff Ever, which she wrote as a participant in the Curious New Voices Summer Intensive. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Nakia Green. Oh gosh, hello. Whoa. Um, whoa. Organization, what is this? All right, hello. My name is Nakia. So I want to start this off by asking you guys, do you guys have a dream? Because uh, I know I do. Um, my name is Nakia, and I said that before, but, um, but for a long time I didn't have a dream, and I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. I couldn't see myself and where I wanted to be. I was kind of floating through high school on the verge of giving up and on the verge of dropping out. But um, when I was in 10th grade four years ago, like you said, um, the second big ass assignment for English class was to write a play. We'd be writing it with the aid of some outside company called Young Playwrights Theater. At the time, I'd never heard of it, but I enjoyed the process of playwriting very much. So much, in fact, that I jumped at the chance to join their out-of-school program, the Young Playwrights Workshop. And for the past four years, it has been a life-changing experience for me. I had never seriously considered the arts as a career path before, yet at my time at YPT, I've seen and spoken with so many inspiring people. It was and still is amazing to have real life examples of what I want to do and what I want to be, and who I want to be as an artist. Uh, now when I was growing up, the only artists I knew were old white guys from Europe. Nobody I knew grew up to be one. Nobody I knew wanted to be one. And I never really got the chance to see what it was like to have the arts play a huge role in my life. And the importance of an organization like the Young Playwrights Theater is something that I will always vouch for, not only to me, but to DC itself. It's a way for young people like me to step into the beautiful artist culture that we have here in the district. And it's a way for them to see that you don't have to have a nine to five job at some company to earn money, and you can do what makes you happy as a career. And if you don't want to pursue a career in the arts, YPT makes it easy to just keep them in your life, like as a hobby. And by supporting us and supporting YPT, you support people like me who were able to find their voices and, yeah. Uh. Um, so that was like a speech introduction, hello. Um, and so now I'm going to perform uh, the uh, Where I'm From poem, which um, 
we got a prompt and the one at the young players workshop we got a prompt to write about where we're from and i was born and raised here in dc so this is um kind of what came to mind when um, i thought about where i'm from um so i'm from the corner of lamont and georgia avenue right across from mary steakhouse or uh, where it used to be i'm from columbia heights before the target there there was dirt before the high-rise apartments there were police sirens i'm from maryland but don't tell dcps a 45-minute drive from PG County into the district, a lie told to everyone since seventh grade. I'm from nowhere, at a crossroads before adulthood, the saltiness of tears shed at 3 a.m., whispers of I love you slowly fading away. I don't know where I am, and I don't know where to go. But what I do know is that I'm from the arts, nose in a book, pencil in my hand, the nervousness before speaking aloud. I'm from the age of the internet, sending Skype messages to people, posting words for millions to see. I'm from despair, I'm from low self-confidence, but I'm also from the prayers of hope. I'm from me. Yeah. Oh, okay, and now the stage reading of the play I wrote. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I wrote, oh, the little bit about the, um, at the summer intensive, it was in Denver, Colorado, where it was essentially like a one-week program that was sponsored by YPT to go. And I just, with other playwrights from around the country, we wrote a play in one week and had it performed by professional actors, which was really incredible. So that was fun. And they're going to read it now. Yay. Oh, that's right, you are. Okay. We rehearsed this. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, the scene starts with a singular figure on a deserted street corner. He is on the phone. Uh, yeah, I, I got the cash, man. <laughs> he was kind of nervous. L look, I told you that was going to happen. All these white kids buying stuff with their parents' money, all of them are going to be nervous. It don't mean nothing. N nah, no cops. I'll hit you up if I need to. Peace. Eric. I need to talk to you right now. Oh, oh John, uh, what are you doing here? That's not important. What are you doing here? Keep your voice down. What, what do you think I'm doing here? It's, it's obvious what I'm doing here. Well, well... You better not be here to buy. Well, I, well, of course not. Good. You don't need to get involved with any of this. He pulls out a cigarette and begins to light it. I'm not here to get involved in anything, and you know I don't like it when you smoke. Yeah, well, get over it. Thank you. Still, answer the question. Why are you here? I, well, I needed to see you. <laughs> Why are you laughing at me? Uh, because, babe, that's hilarious. Don't call me that. Well, you know you love it. But really, is it strolling down here looking like Bill Gates or something? You know how, you think I know how to dress for a, a, a drug deal? I mean... But anyway, this isn't about me. There was no way I couldn't try to find you. After you told me about your family and what you have to do... Yeah, yeah, I, I get it. Look, John, I, I ain't some charity case. Just because some bleeding hard rich boy is feeling generous don't mean... Two weeks. Huh? Two weeks, Eric. You were gone for two weeks. No texts, no calls, no anything. I had no idea where you went, and neither did anyone else. You have no idea how worried I was. How worried I still am. Hey, hey calm down. I I'm here right now, ain't I? But for how long? How long until you're back on corners like this? Selling stuff and wasting your life? Look, I don't know why you even care so much. I'm just another dude in one of your classes, man. Don't worry about me. If something happens to me, something happens. That's how the streets are. You still don't get it, do you? Get what? I, I care about you so much because... Because what? I, nah, just, just forget I said anything. Uh, uh, are you playing around? Are you playing some kind of trick on me? What? No, of course not. Who I, set I just... you up, huh? Oh, one of them kids at school, right? They want to make fun of me or something. No, no, I already told you no. Just, just, just listen. You are one of the most interesting people I know. You're intense and cool, and I can't believe you would want to hang out with me of all people. And, and, and you're so, so handsome and, and. Suddenly, Eric's arms are on either side of him, boxing him in and pinning him to the wall. What are you doing? Let me go. Do you really think you can just say something like that to me and leave? Really? I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. No, I think you do. What was that about me being handsome? Uh, li listen, I, I just said that on an impulse. An impulse. 
Yeah, it, it was simply my brain reacting to the stress that I've been under. So, uh, so you're telling me that you never once thought of me like that? Yes, exactly. Never thought about touching me? N no. How about kissing me? I, I... Neither of them speak for a long moment. Eric sighs, slowly dropping his arms down to his sides and turning away from John. <sighs> what am I doing? <laughs> You were about to... No, I just... It, never mind. It doesn't even matter. What? I said it don't matter. Look, whether you like me or hate me. Eric, what are you talking about? We're from two different places, man. The world don't care how much you like me or how much I like you. You got your whole life ahead of you, and I don't even got one. Wait, I don't... I don't get it. So you... You do like me? Are you even listening? For all them smarts you got, you can re be really dumb sometimes. So that's a no. That's not what I'm saying, and you know it. So what are you saying? Tell me, or, I, or else I won't understand. Fine. You want me to say it? I'll say it. I like you, all right? But I already know you, you're too good for me. I ain't, about, I'm, I ain't gonna amount to anything, and, and you're wasting your time being friends with me. Like, let alone liking me. You can do better, and I'm gonna make sure you do better. That's why I've been gone for two weeks, doing stuff like this and hoping you forget about me. But that's stupid. Well, no. It's what's got to happen. Did you just hear me? No, it's really j just stupid. I could never forget about you. You're the only person who understands me. Oh, come on. You know that's not true. It is. It doesn't matter what you say. The further you push away from me, the closer I just want to pull you back. I don't know if telling you how I feel is a good idea. I don't know if, if being in, in love with you is the right choice. But what I do know is that I can't lose you. But. No, no buts. Who says you can't accomplish things? Who's to say that things will always be like this? You don't know how strong you are, Eric, but I do. Still, though, it, it, it don't matter what you think of me. So what about my mom and sister? Who's going to take care of them if I'm not doing this? Don't you see? You aren't taking care of them. You're hurting them, and you're hurting yourself. John, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay, You ain't never been where I am. You, you don't know where I'm coming from. It, it can't be that hard, really. You can just... Find somewhere to work, or... <laughs> it ain't that simple. <laughs> and you keep acting like you understand when you don't. That's not true. I... No. You're right. I, 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 I don't understand, Eric. Huh? You're right. And, and, and you've been right this whole time. I, I just... I just wanted to help. It's just not fair, and you're right. I'm just some rich white kid acting as if I understand when I don't, and... Hey, hey. It's okay. I get it, man. I really do. And you're not like that. You got heart. You ain't like any of these other dudes I sell to who couldn't care less about me. I still don't get why me, but I do know that you're special and you're important to me. Oh, um, could, could, you, um, could you say that again? <laughs> you're important to me, John. I don't want to lose you either, but there ain't another way for me. You gotta understand that. I, I've been trying. Believe me, I've been trying, but this is all I can do. For now. This is all you can do for now. I know. I don't get it. And I don't understand your situation fully, but you can do so much more. And I know you can. And if you believe in yourself, well, if you can't believe in yourself, I'll just believe for both of us. And I'll keep believing in it until you do. Thanks. And I don't know, soon, maybe we could, we could be something more than this. After I can move on and not drag you down in all this, because you don't deserve that. And neither do you, Eric. Yeah, if you say so. I'd like that. I really would. End of play. <laughs> be agreeing, everybody. Be agreeing. Thank you. Any questions from the council? Frank, Jer uh, Jared, Nakia, join us. Any questions from the council? Congratulations. I know how hard it is to write plays. Um, are you are you working on something new? Oh, oh no. <laughs> I I um see uh the play that we did for the workshop it's throughout the school year uh -huh. and we just finished that so now I'm like kind of burnt out on writing um, not gonna lie I'm not full disclosure but um, 
I would like to. There's a couple plays that I because I like to start and stop, and I'm just like I should probably go back to those plays and finish them. But um, yeah, no, I'm not looking at anything. <laughs> what inspires you on what subject matter where you where you think yeah i could write a play about that what uh are there situations that happen you think oh i could write about that or um what really you know, gets you going uh i'm definitely just like stuff i'm more of a non-fiction person than a fiction person so i like like to look at things around me and situations mm -hmm. around me which inspired that play just sort of like seeing people in my community in dc just how people have to be on the streets and to earn money, that's their only way. And just how I could like talk about like important issues that affect me personally, as well as people I know. Um, I definitely, um, just a lot of social justice issues because that's important to me because um, they affect me whether I want them to or not. But definitely just, just realistic things that happen in my life I want to write about. Yes, I just want to say thank you for the work that, that you do uh, for providing a safe space, a nurturing space for young people to find themselves, find their voice. And I think it's, it's uh, particularly important in this, uh, at this time for the Latinx community, that young community who many times uh, lives in fear and doesn't have, don't have a lot of safe spaces. So I just want to say thank you for all the work that you do and congratulations to you for your creativity. Thank you. I also wanted to comment. I, I, you know, I've known your founder Karen Zacarias for many years. I mean, it's got to be, I think, around twenty-five. Uh, and when I was acting more, I was in one of her plays. Um, and she always talked about this organization, and it never, I never really focused on it. Uh, I never focused on it because we had a job at hand to do, and and we were mounting a show or a workshop. Um, and it's so great to see the organization have a life after its founder. Uh, and that's, this is a great example of that. Uh, and I wanted to congratulate you about, about keeping that legacy going. And it's, it sounds like it's, it's very strong and has a big future. Um, and it's growing, and the work is growing, so congratulations. Thank you, and, and I do want to say that uh, it really wouldn't be possible without the support from organizations like the NEA, who have been a long-term funder of ours and truly make our work possible and working with students like Nikia possible. So thank you for your support. Thank you. I'm struck by, uh, on the technique level, Nikia, your ability to write with such flow. And has that flow or any of the other skills that you've learned in the playwriting process also helped you in other aspects of your life? Oh, definitely. Um, if you compare the, the play that I wrote in 10th grade when I like got introduced to the program to what I write now, I'm just like, oh, improvement, hello. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, we also, we not just learn writing techniques, we also learn acting techniques. Like uh, Frank has taught a couple of improv classes at the workshop. Um, just other various people have come in and taught us things. And so, yeah, definitely um, just, like, stuff to use in real life, such, like, such as writing and just such as writing, and then stuff for fun. Because I don't, I don't want to be an actor, but it's still fun to learn how to use actor techniques, I guess. Yeah, no, it's fine. Congratulations, and thank you so much. Thank you. We have one final piece of business. I'm pleased to announce that the National Council on the Arts has reviewed the applications and the guidelines presented to them, and a tally of the council members' ballots reveal that all recommendations for funding and rejection have passed. And are there any other final comments, questions, or discussion for the council? I'd like to thank the entire NEA staff for the hard work that you put into preparing for the council meeting. Uh, you're awesome. And the 191st meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now adjourned. Have a great weekend. <laughs>